Welcome to lecture two of the senses. We look at taste and smell, <clears throat> the less uh, famous cousins compared to vision and hearing, but both very important senses. It's uh, the chemo receptors. We are measuring chemicals either in your mouth or in the air that give you information. Be able to smell a gas leak, be able to smell something is rotten, something is aromatic. Um, very primitive senses is sensing chemicals in the environment <clears throat> from early, early animals. I mean, protozoans and such can, can sense chemicals in the environment. Chemicals fit into a receptor causing uh, changes that let you become aware that the chemical exists, right? So let's, let's get right to it. This is a shorter uh, lecture than the last one. And smell and taste, what could be more important taste? Uh, when you think about life, great food, uh, great, I like good beer and good wine, the taste and just enjoying that. Uh, and if, you know, it makes pleasure centers in your life and your brain go off. I mean, um, uh, food and sex, you know, really drive us uh, towards survival and reproduction. And so um, very important. And we'll talk about scent really being less important in our, uh, our reproduction, you know, it's kind of on the wayside, but, you know, deer and dogs and, you know, re-smelling uh, the environment to, <clears throat> to look for receptive females, much more important for them. All right, so taste and smell, and they are really closely related. Um, so we have olfaction is another word uh, for smell. And when you look at it's high in our nasal cavity, and when you wanna smell, we'll bring fresh air by sniffing that. <clears throat> and uh, the molecules in the air will bind with receptors on these little hairs on these olfactory cells, and uh, they will fire the neurons in our olfactory nerve, cranial nerve one, go back into our limbic system, into our cerebrum, where we are first become emotionally aware, you know, the, the smell may uh, trigger emotions. And then we will compare it to our library and say, hey, what are we smelling here? And my God, you, if you, you close your nose, you can even bite into an onion and uh, it doesn't, not a lot different than biting into an apple. So, so much of our sense of taste is smell and you enjoy a fine wine, you wanna <clears throat> swirl it to release those chemicals and smell it before you even taste it. Then your mouth, you'll swish it around, bring it on your warm it and more chemicals will waft up your nasopharynx. And so you'll enjoy all the complexities you know, of a wine. It's very little taste, it's almost all smell. You can see you know, almost 80% of what you think I'm really tasting this meal. But every bite comes up to your mouth and then you smell it, right? And if you have a clogged nose, you just don't. Um, food doesn't taste right, just tastes kind of bland. So up there you have, of course, these uh, neurons. If you remember back, one of these cases with a bipolar neuron, they're very simple. On one end, you have uh, cilia with uh, receptors on them for chemicals. On the other end, they go through those little olfactory foramina and that cribriform plate in the ethmoid onto your uh, olfactory bulbs, which carry it back to your olfactory nerve. It's really a tract of your brain. It goes deep within your brain. And it will, those chemicals will light up your, uh, uh, your brain and telling you what kind of uh, chemicals are out in that environment. Indeed, and we will see. If you were to see way up on the very roof, way up there, you'd see a yellowish patch, like quarter size in each of them. And there's a six million little factory cells with little hairs with receptors on them. Yeah, so you can see where they're at and why it's important to take a sniff of fresh air to, to, to bring those chemicals up and they will uh, find themselves in this region along the wall, along the roof, uh, where there's little, I'll show you a good picture. I like this picture here. Little rootlets go through and then that's where molecules will bind to the moist surface and there'll be receptors. So indeed, we could talk about um, uh, the olfactory bulbs at the very end and they're gonna sit right on top of here, top of the cribriform plate. Little holes, the little nerves go through. 
And these neurons are exposed to the outside world. You smell a lot of things. And so they're actually, you make new smell neurons. So if you smell noxious chemicals, it doesn't permanently burn, you know, your sense of smell. And again, the limbic system is your emotions and smell is tied to that. You can smell a lover's perfume, a fresh cut grass, grandma's house. It can make this deep emotional um, um, effect before you even identify the smell. And your cerebrum, of course, is where you identify and you perceive it and you add value and you understand what the smell is. Or if it's a novel smell and you, you start building memories. So this just shows, it's showing uh, the odor of molecules, which are what you're smelling, are going to be going through this olfactory bulb, tracked, and then it'll go into this limbic system. So it turns out you adapt very quickly because we talked about other senses. Smell, you can see within one second, you know, your, your sense of smell drops by 50%. So you, uh, you adapt when you're in a smelly environment of certain, you don't seem to smell it after a while. And they even develop these air fresheners that have two different scents in them that alternate. Because once an air freshener goes, oh, this room smells good, but then you don't smell it anymore. So it's like kind of, for some people, they like that, that freshness, uh, that change. Now, how do we learn all the different smells? Like how many smells do you know? You know, you're probably thinking, well, probably hundreds, thousands. Yeah. Depends on you. There are professional smellers that develop perfumes uh, that have a much better sense of smell probably than you. Um, and how do we do it? Like, um, is there a receptor for chocolate chip cookies and one for bread and uh, uh, one for popcorn, you know, that kind of thing? No, there's not. But there are uh, chemicals that are given off by all these foods I mentioned, by other things in the environment. And those chemicals will attach onto receptors. And it makes this code that you learn, you develop this code um, um, uh, from the environment to know what an apple smells like, to know what chocolate chip cookies smell like. And again, we don't know all the answers, but I'll give you the basics. We think that molecules will bind with several different receptors types. And then it makes a code as you see in this chart. I like this. And so when certain numbers are lit up, you've learned that means it's a certain kind of smell that you can put into words kind of thing. And I like this too, this imagine part of your brain when you take a smell that lights up like this with these circles, and then you interpret that code because you have a whole bunch of like codes to compare it to. You're like, oh, okay, that's goat cheese or something like that. You know, you kind of, doesn't smell very much. Uh, Limburger, the blue cheese kind of has that kind of acid smell. And so uh, it lines up like this. And so smells can be similar, you know, if they have um, similar signatures, but maybe you add a couple more and it, it gives you more subtlety, like, this is a 1978 Bordeaux versus a 77. Well, I wouldn't have any idea, but you know, that kind of thing, people that can tell those subtleties. So that's what we think. There's a code where you have certain neurons lighting up with certain chemicals. And you know, the, in your cerebrum, we just got this great computer that just that interprets that and tells you what you're smelling. Well, we our sense of smell is pretty boring, you know, 12 million olfactory receptors. Your dog's got 220 million, you know? So um, look at that bloodhound. It can, uh, it can follow a, a fugitive, you know, running through the swamp. Always go to water, water, you can escape that way. But um, they, 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 they're able to smell those molecules given off, especially someone in fear that's sweating and running, be able to find that. And this cat, you guys, you know, you know this cat that supposedly uh, lays next to the next person that's gonna die in the old folks home kind of thing. There's a house episode, it turns out. If you're sick, you give off more heat. Maybe you like the heat, but in any case, they're using dogs and cats, uh, especially dogs. Cats don't, they don't give a damn, they're trying to please you. The dogs, you know, are trying to please you. They use them for uh, smelling drugs, uh, for smelling uh, cancer and other diseases. It turns out they're really accurate. In one study, they found out that there was one mistake and it turns out there was the chemical error. The dog was correct. So, you know, if you can, you can train them to make you happy, they smell out snakes in Hawaii because you want snakes getting into Hawaii and things like that. Uh, a cash, you know, in airports, they can, you can train them because they're such good, they smell packages and they can smell small amounts of drugs, everything like that. So their sense of smell is amazing, right? Ours is, is really subdued. And they sniff, you know, uh, fire hydrants and telephone poles and butts of other dogs and they get all this information, you know, because the, the protein part of it is part of their DNA and they can tell, hey, am I relative? Are you uh, in heat? Things like, they get a lot of information from that. 
And it's not surprising when you're hungry, your sense of smell is enhanced, right? So you get hungry, you start, you know, <laughs> is that food I smell, you know, at a distance? All right, so smell. Uh, yeah, you have uh, all these subtle, these chemicals light up parts of your brain where you develop a lexicon early on, a, a library of smells uh, that you can uh, uh, fall back on. So you identify what you're smelling. Is it danger? Um, is it uh, something good to eat? Yeah. Now taste, taste, you have, we're talking about five main tastes. Used to be four. Now we're talking about five is umami as well. But you have taste buds, <clears throat> mostly on your tongue, almost all on your tongue, a little bit on your cheeks, roof of your mouth, back of your throat a little bit. But you have these taste buds that are also, same thing, receptors, little hairs, and they will uh, bind to certain chemicals. But it's not as subtle as smell. You don't have as many tastes. In case you guys are into the mechanism, the uh, biochemistry, the physiology of it, in this case, let's say uh, sweetness, you get glucose, maybe it's kind of a ring structure, it's gonna bind with a certain receptor. You guys remember, God, this was beginning of semester, but G proteins, will make a dental cyclase, create C amp, and C amp is gonna turn on these protein kinases. There's a whole series, binding of the sugar, and then this whole series that's gonna eventually end up with this cell <clears throat> releasing neurotransmitter, it's gonna tell that neuron, dude, you got sugar here. And when you look at sodium uh, and hydrogen ions, uh, salty is it will be uh, ions like sodium or uh, mostly sodium, potassium will also you know, um, be channels like that. Sour is acidic, so hydrogen ions. So both of these kind of have a, a direct, there's channels that will turn on this taste bud. But sweet, um, I'm thinking glucose, sucrose, things like that, but there's other chemicals that taste sweet. Um, will bind to certain receptors, uh, bitter is often uh, alkaloids, different chemicals uh, that cause bitterness will bind. And then this umami will be a amino acid, glutamate, which will bind to it. And then they do the whole G protein, et cetera. So I'm just showing you there's, there's several mechanisms where um, what you put in your mouth and your tongue is going to be translated into uh, the taste. And all these chemicals need to be dissolved in water. So you need spit in order to dissolve the chemicals to get that taste. So these taste buds, they kind of look like uh, like an onion. They have these, well, it's shaped like an onion. They have like these, they have these balls that have neurons and then supporting cells and then little hairs that come out and they have little, uh, the receptors on those hairs. So indeed, taste cells, these cells and these little taste buds. The cells are part of the buds with supporting cells and little hairs, little microvilli that come out that are gonna have the receptors on them. So here's showing a big taste bud. And then you can see these little clear, clear, uh, clearer circles. And those are the taste buds. And like smell, the taste buds, these neurons are renewed. Because we talk about neurons not dividing, like in your brain, but these do. They're exposed to the environment and they're gonna, they, I think they're almost weekly on average. I, don't quote me on that, but they're replaced, your taste buds are all the time. And here you can see in the side of the tongue, you got a bunch of salivary glands making that spit because it has to be wet. Try to dry your tongue and taste anything, it doesn't work. So you have big salivary glands that we'll talk about next semester, but little ones even in the tongue and the mouth that, that moisten your food and allow you to taste things. About 10,000 taste buds. We talked about six to 12 million olfactory cells, right? Also little, little papillae means little nubbins and you have different types of papillae. I, I think your book goes into four or five different types, but these filiform, they don't have taste buds, they have keratin on them. And they're famously, you look at a cat's tongue, you know, but even a deer tongue, cow tongue, have more of these than we do. But uh, these little things are not for taste. For the cat, they'll be for uh, grooming and uh, I'll lick meat off a of bone. It's kind of a raspy tongue, right? Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, so the taste receptors are scattered mostly on your tongue like that. And uh, this shows a picture showing uh, the yellow are neurons with little taste hairs that come out. And then you can see the nerves that carry it back your tongue into your brain. And you guys remember the cranial nerves? Uh, I think we get to it here. I'll get to it in a moment, but uh, it'll be facial, glossopharyngeal, a little bit of vagus for taste. All right, let's get the taste. So. This uh, taste map was, was an interesting case where it was put into textbooks and used for decades because it was thought, oh, sweets in the front only. 
but it's really not accurate. And now we don't really go with this, it's kind of been disproved. Um, there are areas you do tend to taste sweet more in the front and bitter more in the back of your tongue, uh, but throughout your tongue is scattered, there's all kinds of taste buds throughout all of it. So it's, they're not separated out like um, it was depicted in a lot of early textbooks. But sweet, the taste of sweet, us humans love it because we know it's got sugar, calories, carbs in it, right? Um, and there's even a, we'll see an enzyme amylase in your saliva that breaks down starches. So if you chew up a saltine and keep it in your mouth, it starts tasting sweet. I don't know if you did that in high school biology because uh, those uh, carbs, uh, starches turn into sugars and then it's gonna stimulate those sweet receptors. But yeah, so we like that. We like that taste of sweet. Um, uh, sour, um, we'll talk about sour, but uh, looking at uh, acidity. <clears throat> And um, yeah, it can mean different things to us. Salty, yeah. We like to know what's salty. We like salt, we crave salt. We put out salt licks for deer and cattle, things like that. They like, they, we crave <clears throat> getting enough uh, uh, um, salts, enough electrolytes. Uh, bitter, bitter is often a sign of things are um, toxic. We're gonna see a lot of toxins are bitter. So if you get a bitter taste, uh, it's, it's usually a warning, although, you know, we learned to like bitter chocolate or bitter beer and things like that. And then umami means delicious in Japanese. And uh, this is stimulated by amino acids. So it means, oh, we're getting proteins. And so your body craves this too. You want carbs, proteins, uh, electrolytes. So these tastes allow you to take food in the environment and your tongue will tell you, you know, if uh, uh, this is something that's uh, good for you or not. And there's even an idea to add another one. Uh, some cultures add uh, amount of spiciness. So heat, but not temperature heat. That'll be trigeminal nerve, but heat like uh, pepper. Like, uh, it's like capacin is an oil and hot peppers. And, and so the, some people add another, another uh, taste sensation there. I'm all for it. I like spicy food. And of course, taste goes rapid adaptation. Remember I told you the last lecture, your first bite is the most powerful and your, they, your taste buds quickly adapt. So this umami, fascinating. Uh, it's found in uh, cheeses and tomatoes and, 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 and meats. Uh, uh, MSG is really pure you know, soy sauce. It'll give you this umami taste, this kind of uh, flavorful taste of food. And um, yeah, indeed, it was, it wasn't, in my day, it wasn't one of, it was the four tastes, but umami has been added. And what we taste in your normal food, unless you're having a pixie stick, like pure sugar, right? Or uh, um, you got a mouthful of salt, like your food is not one or the other. It's a mixture of these, right? Uh, yeah, margarita, it's got that uh, sour lemon and the salt on the rim kind of going together. Uh, indeed, dark chocolate. You got a little bit of that bitterness in there. It's, uh, it's, so our foods are these wonderful combinations of these tastes that we uh, uh, put in our mouth. And then we, along with the smell, we get these uh, great flavors. Yeah, and um, just to say this too, um, you think about uh, uh, when you have tastes and smells and how different we are. You know, we have very picky eaters out there and people, like me, that there's nothing, you know, I, I don't enjoy any kind of food. Um, and a lot of it's here. I'm not a, I'm not a, I don't have a kid, <laughs> but I'll tell you as a parent, uh, some advice I'll give you and you can, you know, take it or leave it, but you want to give your kids a uh, complex environment of smells and tastes when they're young. That's when your brain is plastic. You know, you learn languages easier. And um, if you just feed your, your kids like, oh, he just doesn't like anything. So I just feed him pizza, fish sticks, and chicken nuggets, you know, because that's what he, otherwise he complains. You're the parent. <laughs> you tell them what to eat. You know, my mom would make me, you know, broccoli, everything. Um, um, and so, indeed, if you do not, your kid will survive. But uh, as an adult, they'll live a life where they have a limited palette of tastes and smells, where they can't appreciate some of the subtleties. And I think is one of the greatest things about life is enjoying this uh, amazing taste meals and, uh, you know, picking out parts of a craft beer, you know, things, you know, that, that uh, 
I really like it. And other people eat just a few things and yeah, they live their life. And I'm, I just put a push for a fuller life can be had. If you have a kid, expose a kid's eating some sushi there as a kid and exposing them, it's going to make them, uh, it's going to expand their palate because once you're an adult, it doesn't expand like that. As, as a kid, you, you add these tastes and flavors, remember, to that kind of uh, um, uh, library that you have of tastes and smells. And so uh, there, I don't give you much parenting advice, do I? I told you, you can't grow up to be anything, right? You're all going to die. I mean, just death is a normal thing. And uh, give your kids a variety of uh, foods in their young. And then look at these people. These people are perfect professional coffee tasters. That's their job. <laughs> you know, I like a good Dunkin' coffee. Sure, put a flavor shot in there. You know, I mean, these people would, you know, would, would uh, recoil in disgust, the, you know, the, my lack of the ability to tell these different coffees apart, light roast, dark roast, you know, so many kinds. But I'm not a real coffee connoisseur. I like the coffee. I like the flavors. But these people are. And think about the wine tasters that tell different vintages and different you know, they talk about, they describe the taste of a wine as having this embarrassing aftertaste. What the hell does that mean, right? And uh, having these, uh, you know, these tannins and oak-like flavors, all these things, and I'm always impressed. But what I'll show you is this wheel, and this is, uh, this is um, useful as a teaching tool. Look at the amount of taste you have versus the amount of smells here that we can tease apart. So which is, which sense is more uh, subtle, what has more, uh, um, a larger palate at your smell. Look at that. You know, so taste is, like I say, is a blunt instrument. And these people, as they taste these coffees, they're really smelling them um, as well. Yes. <laughs> Notice uh, one thing. They're, now they're testing under, underarm deodorant. And it uh, turns out, indeed, uh, overall women have a greater sense of smell than men. Overall. So, uh, uh, yeah. And you could look, I could hypothesize, but it's, it's I find it interesting. All right, let's talk about bitterness, uh, bitter taste. You guys like bitterness? Um, you're probably thinking, you know, why do we make bitter chocolate? Let's make it sweet. Yeah, make it all sweet because that's delicious. Uh, but that uh, bitterness of people that drink coffee black, you know, you know what bitter is like. Uh, hops are a type of flour that's added to beer to give us a bitterness. And there's even IBUs, international bitter units, the bitterness units that you can rank beer based on how bitter they are. And a gin and tonic, delicious in the summertime. Um, the quinine, which you put into real tonic water, the gin and tonic was invented to fight malaria in India. Um, it was found that quinine uh, helped against malaria, which is a mosquito-borne disease. Um, and a good way to make it go down is to put some gin in it, you know, to make it into some lemon, some lime. So yeah, so uh, quinine, I can see that bitter taste, but it's it's still pleasing sometimes that that, that bitterness. And it turns out in the world, we could do this example. There's a class we could have, there's a tasting paper that tells you if it tastes bitter, you're a super taster. And among all of you, about a quarter of you are super tasters, about a quarter of you don't taste that much and about half of you are in the, in the middle. And those super tasters, um, you can see more, more women than men, and uh, they don't like um, even broccoli, but especially Brussels sprouts, um, uh, cabbage, it's really bitter to them. Even some diet sodas, they don't taste sweet, they taste bitter to them. So super tasters have more of these uh, receptors and, they, and, they, and they, um, they, 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 they taste some things as being extremely bitter. Another one is cilantro. There's a genetic basis. I love cilantro. My brother hates it. Says it tastes like soap, does, does not like it. And so there's a, there's a basis for uh, how you taste cilantro, you know, which is, I love it, yeah. Indeed, and so this bitter taste often tells us about some, the food is not good. There's some bitter uh, uh, toxins. And so it, you know, it's important for us evolutionarily to recognize this and maybe spit it out if it's uh, something that's gonna harm us. All right, artificial sweeteners, fascinating. So you can use sugar, it has the calories, but we've identified these other chemicals that bind with these um, sweetness receptors and make it taste sweet. And I just love these examples. You guys can read them here. It's often so accidental. Look at this, saccharin, 1879, a guy licked his fingers by mistake. It's like, oh, that's sweet. 
Imagine being in a chemistry lab or not allowed you know, to be actually you know, licking your fingers or smoking. Yeah. And so uh, another one, yeah, next one is smoking. A graduate student here uh, identified a cyclamate when you uh, smoking a cigarette in lab. We don't even let you, you know, chew gum in lab. But, uh, indeed, so you identified equal, you know, the pink one. Aspartame, yep. <clears throat> yeah. And then sucralose. Oh, yeah, it was a... Uh, a student that didn't uh, speak very good, good English and thought she did tasting instead of testing and tasted it and it was sweet. You know, all of a sudden, you know, we have uh, Splenda. So, yeah. So anyway, it's kind of accidentally we found out these things and stevia is a naturally occurring plant. It's really, really sweet. So there's artificial sweeteners. You can see their shapes. They're, they're quite varied uh, indeed, but all of these also taste sweet to us without the calories. And there's some thoughts about some causing cancer and such. For a long time, saccharin thought to cause cancer. And I think it does in rats, but not humans. I mean, it's still, we would not have it out there if it, you know, there was conclusive evidence. Did I just scare you? Was that, was that um, discomforting? <laughs> you all have heard it. All right, so <clears throat> this, uh, uh, we taste things on our tongue and then we have these, remember your tongue has lots of cranial nerves going to it, hypoglossal for moving it around. A branch of the trigeminal for texture and pain, you know, get pierce your tongue or bite your tongue. And then for taste, the facial nerve, number seven, does the anterior two thirds. And then glossopharyngeal does the back. I don't show it here, but vagus does a little bit of the back of the throat and little sides of your tongue. All of these take the information back into your brain stem, go to your cerebrum where you'll identify those tastes. Put together with the smells, you enjoy your meal. Gustation, gustatory is tasting. Olfaction is smelling, so you should know those terms. Yeah, texture of food, uh, it's gonna be cranial nerve uh, five, you can't see it, is uh, the trigeminal. All right, and finally, um, as you age, what happens to your sense of taste? Well, some people not that much, but generally as you get older, yeah, the number of taste buds decreases. And what does that mean? I mean, people don't, you know, the old folks home, they test your vision and hearing. And they often taste is, is thrown to the wayside. Um, it can come into play if people lose their sense of taste, they lose their enjoyment of food. And as an elderly person, if you don't eat enough, you'll become frail. And so yeah, that is an issue. And we well, also have teeth issues too that cause you not to be able to get enough nutrition as you get older as well. Um, and a lot of it is a decrease in smell. Like I say, older people sometimes will put on too much cologne or too much perfume. Uh, because their sense of smell is so diminished. Yeah. yeah, And you can see elderly people, they did experiments where they used more salt in their tomato soup than a, a younger person because they, they have less taste buds and they needed more. All right, and then lastly, I like to, to you know, bring things in like uh, uh, these beautiful fields of lavender, right? The smell, especially as a, let's talk about aromatherapy quickly. Um, First of all, I'll digress. I think you guys have, have, you've heard me lecture and you see a lot of alternative medicines and you'll see things coming up. And I just want to let you know, if um, alternative medicine, if it worked and if it's shown to work, we just call it medicine, okay? So alternative just means that there has not been proof that it works. Um, things like homeopathy are ridiculous that they, the, it's been shown again and again, they do nothing and you dilute something a million times and it's supposed to help cure things. So there's all kinds of people making money out there based on therapies that people think, oh, it's more natural, you know, it's not a, a pill, it's, not my it's a natural chemical. What the hell does that mean? I mean, chemicals are chemicals. So yeah, anyway, the, I'll just let you know, there's a, a lot of alternative things out there uh, for health that are crap, that don't do anything. Some of them are placebo effects, you know, so I guess you feel better, but um, uh, they're, they're out there to make money. They're out there to make money, and um, if they can sell you something and they don't have to prove any claims, if it's a supplement and not a medicine, then they will. So be aware of that, uh, right? Like, you like that? Alternative medicine is called medicine. If we have studies that show it works, then we use it. It's not like someone is hiding this therapy because it works, but, you know, we don't want to... <laughs> We don't want we don't want to use it. We're gonna we're high. like people think oh pot you know marijuana cures cancer, but you know we're hiding that fact because we don't like. No, and if it works, we're gonna use it, right? Um, 
And uh, so there is no big conspiracy. There can't be a conspiracy when you have enough people. It's, you know, there's, uh, anything that is going to work, uh, we'll go ahead and use it and make sure it works. Get past that, but so aromatherapy. What's with that? Um, well, smelling things, uh, you know, if it puts you in a better mood, and remember, if it influences your emotions, then a better mood is going to be less stress, less cortisol, meaning you have to be able to heal better, and you can be more healthy. So almost anything that relieves stress can be useful uh, in making you you heal better. And so again, that opens up a huge door that everything can be a medicine, right? Uh, but it works again, just by uh, altering your mood, which can uh, affect your stress levels, right? And there are some um, aromatherapy things that are actually uh, antimicrobial, <clears throat> some chemicals that actually, you know, uh, can, can kill some, uh, some, some, some bad guys. But cool studies, you guys can look into it. And they, they did studies, you know, if you, uh, especially lavender, vanilla is a, a smell that is pleasing to a lot of people and uh, uh, is a good mood alterer, right? Yeah. All right, I think I will we'll end with that. All right, so a quicker lecture, uh, taste and smell. Again, you adapt really quickly. So if you walked in my house here, you would, see, it, you would those smells would hit you. Uh, and then, uh, but once you're here for a while, it's, it's, it's there. Uh, but if I cook some cookies, it, uh, smell would uh, uh, get you up there. When I eat something, again, a lot of it is the odor that's, that I smell along with that food. All right, I think you guys got it. So now we're left with uh, some, some vision and hearing. And uh, so I'll save some lectures uh, and uh, describe the eyes and the ears and the equilibrium next.